Concept 8, Fluid and Electrolytes. Goals for today's presentation is 1. Define and describe this concept. 2. Discuss the risk factors for impaired fluid and electrolyte balance. 3. Recognize the causes of fluid and electrolyte imbalance. And 4. Provide appropriate nursing and collaborative interventions to promote fluid and electrolyte balance. Okay, so fluid and electrolyte balance uh, definition is the process of regulating the extracellular fluid volume, body fluid osmolality, and plasma concentrations of electrolytes. Scope and categories. Optimal extracellular uh, volume is in the middle. Excess is to the right and deficit is to the left. Uh, and that's in, in the arrow A. Arrow B is optimal osmolality. Uh, they're talking about electrolytes and osmolality. Uh, sodium is 100, 135 to 145 milliequivalents is normal. Too concentrated is sodium of greater than 145. Osmolality greater than 300. Too little or too dilute of fluids is a sodium of less than 135 and an osmolality of less than 280. This is in arrow B. Arrow C is optimal potassium concentration is um, 3.5 to 5, and hyperkalemia, which is too much, is potassium greater than 5, or too little is hypokalemia, which is potassium less than 3.5. That's an arrow C. Populations at greatest risk are um, the very young and the very old. As you get older, your fluid capacity decreases, and when you're young, your fluid capacity uh, is greater than your body mass. On page 63 in your concepts book, chapter 8, it is showing you in uh, figure 8-2, the first um, picture shows equivalent uh, fluids, uh, normal output, normal intake. So the extracellular vascular fluid um, is normal, the osmolality is normal, and the plasma electrolytes are normal. Normal output is balanced by normal intake. In the next picture, extracellular value is normal, the osmolality is normal, and the plasma electrolytes are normal. But this is decreased output balanced by decreased intake. And the third picture, extracellular volume is normal, osmolality is normal, and plasma electrolytes are normal um, because increased output is balanced by increased intake. Now if you look in Concepts Chapter 8 again at um, page 66, the A picture is normal output but deficient intake or absorption. So you can see where the extracellular uh, volume is a deficit, the osmolality is too high, and the plasma electrolytes are deficits, meaning too low. Um, in the next picture, increased output is not balanced by increased intake. So you have an increase of intake, um, decrease of output, which means the extracellular volume has a deficit, and the osmolality is too high, and the plasma electrolytes have deficits as well. Um, in the B picture, output is less than excessive or too rapid of an intake. So in this case, um, the extracellular volume is an excess, the osmolality is too low, and the plasma electrolytes are excess. And the next picture is decreased output, not balanced by decreased intake. So you have de um, extracellular um, um, Fluid excess, you have osmolality too low, and plasma electrolyte excess. Also, just to note, the ECV uh, that you see um, in this chapter is actually extracellular fluid, which we call ECF. Water regulation is influenced by... Um, several things. Um, one of them is uh, habit of uh, thirst, oral intake, and um, the most important reason for thirst is increased osmolality of body fluids or dry mucous membranes, also angiotensin 2, angiotensin 3, and arterial 
baroreceptor stimulation during severe hypovolemia also trigger thirst. Um, electrolytes also have an influence on water regulation. Um, let's see. Uh, as far as um, the role of fluid in the body, the role of fluid in the body um, produces saliva, regulates body temperature, um, gets rid of uh, toxins, is important for bowel movements, and basically uses water in all its cells, organs, and tissues to help regulate um, temperature and maintain other bodily functions. Um, because your body loses water through breathing, sweating, and digestion, it's important to rehydrate, as you know. It makes up, water makes up about 60% of um, our bodies and our blood is 90% water. Water is essential for kidney function and other bodily functions. It lubricates the joints. It forms saliva and mucus. It delivers um, oxygen throughout the body. It cushions the brain, spinal cord and other ish, uh, tissues. Again, um, it's important for regulating body temperature and um, the digestive system also is dependent on it. It's important for uh, flushing out waste through urine and feces. Also, it maintains blood pressure and um, the airways need it. If we don't have it, uh, this can make your asthma and allergies worse. It makes minerals and nutrients accessible. Uh, because they dissolve in water, it prevents kidney damage because it prevents kidney stones and it carries nutrients to the cells for food. Electrolyte regulation includes um, aldosterone, which is released from the adrenal cortex, um, also the antidiuretic hormone, and remember that they can uh, help with um, potassium depletion or potassium overload. Also, um, the antidiuretic hormone has to do with the sodium uh, release or retention, which influences fluid as well. Electrolyte distribution. Um, all the electrolytes except for sodium, um, which has a high concentration in the extracellular fluid, that reflects osmolality. Electrolytes have low concentrations in the extracellular fluid compared to their concentration in their electrolyte pools. The potassium pool is inside cells, which contain almost 98% of total body potassium. Um, bone is an important um, calcium pool where the calcium hangs out. Magnesium pools include inside cells and bones and physiologically inactive forms of calcium and magnesium bind to albumin or other anions um, that sit in electrolyte pools. Um, opposing factors influence distribution of electrolytes between the extracellular fluid and the electrolyte pools. For example, two hormones influence calcium distribution, the parathyroid hormone, otherwise known as PTH, from the parathyroid glands, and calcitonin from the thyroid. Calcitonin moves calcium into the bone. PTH shifts calcium from the bone into the extracellular fluid. Unusual um, amounts of factors that shift electrolytes can alter their distribution and cause plasma, electrolyte deficits, or excesses, excesses as well. As far as fluid and electrolyte imbalances, um, you could have impaired perfusion, impaired gas exchange, oxygenation, impaired cerebral function, and impaired neuromuscular function. A normal volume of extracellular fluid is necessary to provide tissue perfusion and give oxygen to the cells. Moderate or severe extracellular fluid deficit, or I should say extracellular volume deficit, reduces tissue perfusion by decreasing blood pressure. Very severe extracellular volume uh, deficit leads to hypovolemic shock, a condition that severely impairs perfusion and oxygenation. Extracellular volume excess can also impair oxygenation 
edema fluid or edematous fluid from extracellular volume excess pushes cells farther from the capillaries, creating a larger distance for oxygen to diffuse before it reaches the cells. Severe hyperkalemia causes cardiac arrests. Um, osmolality imbalances cause shriveling of the cells in cases like hypernatremia um, or swelling, hyponatremia of the cells. Impaired cerebral function occurs with either condition under or over extracellular volume. The usual cerebral impairment is decreased level of consciousness. Also seizures may occur if the osmolality changes too fast. Impaired neuromuscular function um, is uh, a response to plasma concentration. If there's imbalances of potassium, calcium, magnesium, they can impair neuromuscular function if you have um, a calcium magnesium or a magnesium deficit, it causes muscle twitching and cramping. If you have a um, potassium uh, deficit, you're gonna it's gonna cause flaccid um, muscle flaccid, flaccid muscles and muscle weakness. I think I said deficit of potassium. I meant too much potassium can cause the flaccid muscle uh, weakness. Sorry about that. An assessment, uh, symptoms of fluid electrolyte imbalances are nonspecific. Consider symptoms in the context of the risk factors uh, for vomiting, diarrhea, organ failure, unexplained nausea, <clears throat> fatigue, um, shortness of breath, muscle cramping, edema, and sudden changes in weight. These uh, imbalances will um, be found in your book under the electrolytes uh, imbalances. And if you look on page uh, 70, you'll see Table 8-2, Clinical man Manifestations of Electrolyte Imbalances. Um, that should help you, and as well as um, Clinical Manifestations of a Disrupted Fluid Balance is also on that same page. Clinical findings um, as far as fluid imbalance um, are dependent on the type of imbalance uh, and the severity. And you want to consider the functions of the following fluid compartments to think and think about symptoms if there is too much or too little. Again, this is on page 70, table 8-1. Uh, for too little volume, too much volume, too dilute um, in terms of osmolality or too concentrated. Again, there's a nice uh, table for you, uh, table 8-1 on page 70. Okay, so we have uh, direct measurements of serum, serum levels, sorry, and that would be on page 70. So um, Okay, so let's go over normal ranges again. For uh, potassium, it is 3.5 to 5.0. I think I already stated the sodium is 135 to 145. Um, and the potassium is 3.5 to 5. The magnesium is 1.3 to 2.1. EKGs can show changes from electrolytes, especially with potassium levels. And I think it's an inverted, uh, yes, uh, U wave at the end of the QRS uh, T uh, that would indicate an imbalance um, as well. Primary prevention to minimize risk factors uh, is patient teaching about fluids and electrolytes um, and dietary measures uh, regarding these changes that they may need to make. Fluid management is adequate intake, uh, especially with vomiting or diarrhea, and limiting intake when um, you're prone to edema and probably limiting your salt as well. Secondary prevention um, is there's really uh, no screening for fluid and electrolyte imbalance, um, but they would sometimes draw your blood and check um, as part of a disease or an illness. Collaborative measures include oral fluids. 
IV fluids for re water replacement, electrolyte supplements and replacement, um, orders for potassium, um, sodium chloride, magnesium, and calcium would come from the uh, provider. Uh, pharmacotherapy includes diuretics, insulin, and vasopressin. Additional interventions would be um, daily weights, especially for someone with edema, or fluid gain or fluid loss, uh, monitoring fluid I's and O's, uh, safety measures, especially for those who are having a decrease in level of consciousness with electrolyte disturbances um, or volume disturbance, in other words, uh, imbalance of volume. Uh, too little volume hypovolemia, which would lower your blood pressure. Comfort measures um, for nausea, vomiting, and anything that would uh, be an electrolyte imbalance um, uh, problem. Um, also oral hygiene, frequent oral hygiene for people with uh, dehydration and patient teaching on all of the above. These are some of the interrelated concepts to the fluid and electrolyte management, uh, nutrition, mobility, hormonal regulation, cognition, perfusion, gas exchange, acid-base balance, and elimination. They're all interrelated. As you can see, the arrows are going back and forth. The exemplars of fluid and electrolyte imbalance include fluid imbalances of extracellular volume deficit, extracellular volume excess, um, I didn't mean volume, I meant vascular, sorry. Hypernatremia, which is increased uh, osmolality, and hyponatremia, which is decreased osmolality, um, which happens with water intoxication, and dehydration, which is extracellular volume deficit plus hypernatremia. Electrolyte imbalances, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypermagnesemia. Question, what is an example of a third space? You should be answering the interstitial compartment. What are examples? Include all the examples, it should say, of regulated routes of fluid and electrolyte output. What kind of things regulate fluid and electrolyte output? Um, that would be, for sure, urine and sweat, skin and lungs, feces and vomit, not so much tears and nasal secretions. So you should have the first three. And what is the most common route of fluid and electrolyte intake? And your answer should be oral. That is the end.